Good day. My name is TJ Hills, and uh, I am a patient advocate, and I'm here to talk to you today about um, estrogen metabolism dysfunction and treatment as it uh, is related to precision or genetic testing. Um, I'd like to start out just telling you a little bit about myself because I am not a physician and I am not in the medical field except as a patient advocate. I was diagnosed with stage 2B or now 3 breast cancer in 2009. At the time, I had absolutely no family history, both extended or immediate. Um, and it was um, like a, a, a jolt to the entire family. Uh, I did not like my prognosis odds. Uh, I was told that if um, I did everything that everyone told me to uh, successfully, that I would have a 30% chance of recurrence in five years. And if I did not do any treatment, I would have a 70% chance of death within five years. Um, so I found that pretty disturbing. I had two young children, um, three actually young children. And so I started studying adjunct treatments. And my background is actually in political science and finance. I have um, run a company specializing in financial re research and political risk for over 25 years. And so while I did not know a lot about medicine, I do know quite a bit about statistics. And so I was able to train myself to read studies and to interpret the information and decide for myself uh, what was important or not. Now, I live in New York City, uh, and so I, because of my proximity to some of the best hospitals in the world, um, had access to a lot of cutting-edge research at the time. I had access to a lot of experimentation in cell, stem cell treatments, in cancer vaccines, some very innovative treatments going on. It was the very early stages of uh, immunotherapy, and um, uh, at the time, though, I met a biochemist and began to study estrogen metabolism, and I decided to choose that as my adjunct treatment. Um, I founded, along with some other uh, women, um, the Hormonal Cancer Foundation, and then more recently, the Better Estrogen Foundation. My website, where I uh, promote myself for public speaking so that I may uh, inform physicians and women um, about estrogen metabolism function, particularly as it affects breast cancer, is at betterestrogen.com. And I ran the estrogen gene test company for several years. A little bit more about me. Again, I was age 44 at the time of my diagnosis. I had no family history. I went through as much of standard treatment as I could, but I um, was unable to maintain a uh, white blood cell count even with all of the help. And so finally, my treatment was aborted a little bit early after repeated hospitalizations. I did a full course of uh, radiation, and then I began to mexican. And after all of that, I joined an estrogen metabolism study, and I started uh, nutritional supplementation to improve my estrogen function. Um, later, when it became available, uh, I had oncotype testing, which showed that I had a 15% recurrence risk, which still uh, did not make me uh, uh, relieved. So uh, the learning objection, objectives for this presentation are to learn about estrogen metabolism, uh, dysfunction, gene testing, uh, exogenous and endogenous estrogen exposure, and how it relates to breast cancer, as well as the nutritional interventions uh, that may improve estrogen function, the critical patient populations which require testing. And I'd like to talk about uh, what I advocate as a new standard of care um, for all women. Um, and then uh, most of my time will be spent on case studies. If you, uh, this is a diverse audience, I understand. And so if you would like to study more of uh, the background information, there is a lot of information, references, favorite studies of mine in the physician area of my website. And if you would like a full uh, refresher course on estrogen metabolism, my former chief scientific officer and partner, uh, Dr. Joe Beltman, 
uh, has many hours of that in the estrogen gene test company uh, physician training videos area. So I am going to very quickly speed through a review of um, a little bit of the background before proceeding to case studies. And you know, just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, I, I'm, they're, they're often, they're often when you're talking about gene testing and breast cancer is, uh, is an automatic assumption about um, hereditary predisposition for breast cancer. And that is not at all what I'm talking about. In fact, um, I'm only talking about estrogen metabolism uh, function. And the reason this slide is here is just to show that 80% you know, of all breast cancer patients have no family history. Um, any form of breast cancer. And 75% of all breast cancer is fueled by estrogen. I think it's uh, pretty well known, but for those of you who don't spend uh, a lot of time studying uh, breast cancer, um, one of the most common the common denominator in breast cancer risk factors is estrogen, overall estrogen exposure. And so one of the reasons we have an increase in breast cancer is simply because of longevity. The older you are, the greater your risk of cancer is in the, and the reason for that in this particular uh, estrogen receptor positive cancers is because of your overall estrogen exposure increases with your age. So to the normal list, uh, this is from breast cancer, uh, organiz uh, breast cancer, uh, dot org. Um, I would add also old birth control pills in addition to uh, hormonal replacement therapy and infertility medications. And that is specifically as it relates to women who have an estrogen metabolism dysfunction. So I think, I think the important thing to note about this is that everything on this list, especially if you are you know, living in America and let's say you're a middle-aged woman, uh, you've had extensive exposure to photoestrogens, um, but everything apart from that, and that is what I would call a normal natural exposure now in the United States, um, is, is a, a, what I would call a natural thing. You're a woman, you age, you have your regular family histories, your race, your ethnicity, whether you're overweight, how, your, how many babies you have, how long you breastfeed, or if you breastfeed at all, what age you get your period. You know, these are natural things. And so um, the, I think the, the objective here is to ascertain which, if 12% of all women in the United States will wind up with some form of a breast cancer diagnosis. That means 10% of those women will have an estrogen related or few of breast cancer, which means there's 90% of these women in the United States who these factors don't apply to. And I think that it's important for us to use this information in genetic testing to ascertain who's really a more at risk or not. So just to be clear, and I'm going to rush through these because we have a limited amount of time. And uh, if you are interested in the biochemistry behind this, I encourage you to go to either one of those websites. But uh, in this slide, um, you see to the right-hand side, this is the part of estradiol, which um, tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors are effectively, um, uh, effectively decreasing breast cancer mortality because they are binding um, to the estrogen receptor and blocking that action. What we're focusing on, but nonetheless, a standard breast cancer diagnosis still leaves um, a significant recurrence risk. And so what we're focusing on is the other pathway, which is the metabolism pathway, which is on the left-hand side of this chart. And that is what the rest of uh, this presentation is focusing on. And I'm not, I'm not going to belabor this, but I do want to talk about the genes that control that left-hand side of the brain. So you have three families of and uh, all genetic testing companies who uh, offer this commercially are only looking at modifiable genes. Um, you have the CYP family, uh, you have COMT, and you have the GS, GST family. 
And those are the three, as well as the MNSOD. And each genetic testing company has a variant of this, depending on how recently their test was formed, the most current research. But those those are the overall the overall types of genes families that we're looking at. And what we're trying to do, the objective here, is to increase uh, a woman's ability to effectively excrete through urine and sweat to uh, the green areas. So again, this is the chemical action of what happens when you have a mutation on one of these genes. Um, I like, there's there's a lot of information in, in both of the websites, I apologize. Um, I like this particular uh, study because it is a pooled study with 427 controls, 427 breast cancer patients, which shows that the more mutations on those families of genes um, and combined with the more estrogen exposure will result in the more breast cancer. And this, this chart is um, also able, able to see, and what's you know visually impactful here is that you'll see that women who have less than three mutations on these on these genes um, are are healthy, less at risk. And then the profiles of both the women at high risk and the women with breast cancer are essentially identical. So what it isn't that tips women over the edge, and that is typically their uh, exogenous. Um, or endogenous as estrogen exposure. So in, in these families, we're looking at um, only modifiable genes. Um, and this is one particular paper. This is an uh, old paper. There have been others which uh, update, update this. Uh, but depending on race, depending on the genes looked at, the numbers change. But for example, in this paper, uh, depending on the amount of mutations you have and the combination of those thereof, uh, your 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 risk, breast cancer risk, could be uh, anywhere from double to 13-fold. And where I'd like to focus uh, for the rest of our time together is on the multiple options that you have available to improve uh, the genetic um, pathway function. So in general, we're looking at DIM, which is um, DIM, indole-3-carbonyl, uh, cruciferous vegetable mixes, which are available on the market. Uh, any, any form of potent antioxidant, all physicians tend to have their preference, could be mega doses of vitamin C, um, NAC, and as well as SAMe, which is you know, available over the counter. As are everything else, there's also uh, fish oils, which are which are a part of the uh, part of part of the intervention. So uh, the rest of our, our time is going to be spent on how how getting this testing can result in a clinical clinical decision making. Do you have a few SNPs? Do you have does your patient have a few SNPs? Have they had prior estrogen exposure? Do they have many SNPs, or are they a breast cancer patient? So I um, feel pretty strongly that uh, all women should have estrogen metabolism gene tests. And ideally, I think that that new protocol for care should happen uh, before a woman is sexually active, because this information would allow <clears throat> any woman to plan essentially her lifelong fertility cycle. Uh, if she took birth control pills are very different than they used to be in the past. So that is not at this time known to be terribly impactful. But nonetheless, if you have a, a 13 year old girl who you've had tested and you find that she has every single mutation or deletion um, in her profile, then perhaps you would not want to prescribe uh, a young girl um, with uh, even the very low dose birth control. But that, that's a complicated question, and, and uh, it is sufficiently low dose to, uh, 
to to be administered, but perhaps with caution. So I think that this testing really allows physicians to treat their, their patients on an individual basis. It would allow physician confidence in prescribing hormonal replacement therapy or bioidentical hormones, whether or not a person should have 12 rounds of fertility treatments, whether or not she should delay having childbirth, um, and how critically any patient has to be watched in terms of her lifelong breast cancer risk. And the interventions are simple. However, um, the, that, that's, that's my personal goal, but the critical populations that should be tested, really should be tested, or anyone who has breast, prostate, ovarian, or endometrial cancers uh, themselves or in their family, Anyone who has had significant exposure to hormone replacement therapy, bioidentical hormones, fertility medications, or old birth control pills, um, 20 years of old birth control pills, for example, polycystic ovarian syndrome patients, those with fibroid tumors, and severe acne, which requires medication. All of those uh, estrogen metabolism dysfunction is implicated in the conditions. And one of the big uh, very, very clear symbols of the dysfunction is irregular bleed. That is um, almost where, where we are. I'm going to talk about myself for quite a long time when we get to it, but um, what I am advocating is that physicians do a estrogen metabolism extended family history in order to assess um, if, if those dysfunctions are running in the family. Uh, estrogen exposure history is, is standard, standard care already that every, every woman have the metabolism gene test and that allows the physician to determine individual risk. Um, and that will allow a physician to easily uh, inform their estrogen medications prescriptions. For example, there's a lot of physicians who will really hesitate to prescribe HRT or bioidentical hormones uh, since since the uh, Women's Health Initiative. And if everyone had this test, uh, I believe that prescriptions would go back up because most women would actually be in the clear. And the, the, the ability to alter the genomic pathways is, uh, is easy. The, the interventions are easy, they're non-toxic, and the dosing of those interventions can be monitored with uh, metabolite tests. I'm, uh, before I digress, I'm just going to show an example of um, my former company's um, uh, uh, mutations. Uh, genetic testing is available at Genesense, which is in Austria. Um, Genova Diagnostics has an old test. That was the one I originally took. Um, uh, DNA Life, which is part of Nordic Laboratories, has a test. Toolbox Genomics, there's a few other companies. Oftentimes, the genetic, the estrogen metabolism mutations will be classified under detoxification um, panels, and they can be used as well. And so, in this particular chart, what we're showing is uh, the interventions which improve the the function. So, Dimpro, with, or you know, the indole three carbonyl for those who, who don't prefer uh, the stability of Dimpro. Um, Dimpro, indol 3 carbonyl, cruciferous vegetables, fish oils, SAMe, and an antioxidant of choice. Uh, those protocols would also include keeping a low BMI, if at all possible, as uh, sometimes obesity could deter the results of tamoxifen in aromatase inhibitor or, or these interventions as well. Um, Oh, uh, um, estrogen is is produced in the fat cells, endogenous estrogen, and so obesity is a factor as potent in some cases as as taking estrogenic medications. So uh, that is one of the prescriptions for improving estrogen health as well. So I'm just going to talk about myself. Let me check uh, how much time I have left. Uh, I am going to talk about uh, what happened to me at Len. 
So uh, what happened to me is that I went through three extremely strong, um, extremely strong uh, IVF treatments, fertility treatments, and I participated in between uh, in between result two and three of the treatments in a very high dose DHEA study for for a few months, which was supposed to improve my my ovarian function. And um, after I completed those three treatments, um, about a year later, approximately, um, I began having irregular bleeding, which I had never had before. Um, and this, um, this uh, became more severe and more severe. And I started to see um, OBGYNs. And um, uh, most of the physicians just diagnosed me as perimenopausal at the time. I was 41, 42, 43 years old. And although none of the blood work confirmed that I was anywhere close to perimenopausal, and my mother and her sisters had begun menopause at traditional ages between 53, 55. And, uh, you know, I was uh, very busy running my, my company. And I would have continued to ignore my irregular bleeding, but the irregular bleeding was making my migraines uncontrolled. And so I kept going to different doctors um, so that I could uh, continue my very high functioning alpha life. And um, uh, the only thing I was eventually offered was a birth control pill, which I didn't want to take because I knew it made my migraines work. But I finally tried it, and, um, and that was really disastrous. Um, and finally, my husband put me in touch, insisted I see this integrated physician uh, pretty close to our home. And she started me on indole 3 carbonyl, which was the first time where the bleeding began to regulate. However, it was too late because a, um, a, about two months or so after I began that treatment and, and started attending that OBGYN practice, um, my lump was found. And so one of the things that really motivates me in my work here to promote uh, estrogen gene test function is what if <clears throat> originally when I first started having irregular bleeding and first started seeing physicians, if I had been put on the interventions, if I had been, you know, my case history had been uh, taken, my family history and my genetic background, and I had had these uh, interventions um, put into play at that earlier stage, what would have happened? Would I have developed the aggressive breast cancer that I have or not? So uh, going back to me, so now we can add uh, 20 years of old birth control pills, three rounds of very high uh, dose IVF and the DHEA study, as well as these other um, factors. I'm a woman. I had had one baby at that time. I had failed in breastfeeding. I had had a you know, pretty normal menstrual history. Um, I had drank quite a bit of alcohol and you know I'm an urban female in the United States, so I had plenty of photoestrogen exposure. Now, this is the piece that I believe should be added to intakes. Uh, my sister, most importantly, had had um, an emergency ovarian removal when she was about 14 years old. And after that, her, her, she got in pain. Her ovary was about as big as a grapefruit. She had emergency surgery. And ever since then, she's had severe endometriosis. So that was you know, the first clue about my estrogen metabolism function. If you go back, uh, one of my aunts uh, was infertile, or that was the given explanation. We, my mother didn't appear to have any background. Uh, her sister had um, a lot of painful fibroid tumors. She ultimately had an early hysterectomy. She had endometriosis. And my great aunt, which is actually the same age as my aunt, um, was also infertile. And I don't have any information about my grandmother. Uh, so, so you have a lot of people that, you know, there were clues to the estrogen metabolism dysfunction. Um, and so this is a recent study. Um, 
that uh, a very recent study, which is on uh, one of the, my website, which talks about how uh, indole-free carbonyl and them may reduce the risk of hormone-dependent cancers. Um, and I think that um, uh, my other point is that it may actually improve the prognosis of women with breast cancer. So I really strongly encourage you, who are, you those of you who are interested in pursuing this in your in your practices, to to go do uh, listen to some of the videos and uh, pull down some of the studies on my website. So me, uh, as a person with irregular bleeding, would have qual classified here uh, as someone who had many mutations and significant, very significant prior estrogen use, as well as exogenous, uh, as exogenous exposure. So I'm gonna keep talking about me. And now I have a breast, uh, I have breast cancer. So now if I had come into your practice, I think, I think, you know, it's very, very important for me based on a lot of questions I've had in the past and, um, is that to, to state that improving estrogen function for a breast cancer patient is always, always, always an adjunct treatment to be added on after all traditional treatment is, um, is completed. There is a lot of um, controversy about adding antioxidants while under traditional cancer therapy. And I think, um, I think that taking the conservative line and um, not doing these interventions during standard treatment is the is the path forward. So now uh, I've told you already about my breast cancer diagnosis. What I'd like to show you is how my chart is looking. So uh, now we can add me with a very aggressive breast cancer to my family history chart. And if I were doing a new intake, we can just add my very aggressive breast cancer uh, with my unacceptable to me prognosis um, to my family history. And uh, what I'd like to show you now, well, let me, let me just talk about this. This is another very interesting study that was just presented at the um, annual meeting for American um, Cancer Research where um, they have found, um, they have found, now these women were not actually having uh, any interventions, but in this study, what they found based on all of these women who they followed up for 18 years, which is why it's very interesting. This is uh, based on the Long Island breast cancer uh, study. So these women were followed for 18 years and those of the women who had um, less, who had better estrogen health or better estrogen metabolism ratios, um, assuming, I'm, I'm assuming that had they been genetically tested, you would find that those women had less mutations um, than the ones had a better mortality outcome. So um, I think that adding Adding the interventions to improve your estrogen health can help you and uh, you know improve your breast cancer diagnosis. Now, this is what happened to me. This is not a full case study, but I just want to I want to conclude my own case history with um, with what happened in my family. So I was diagnosed in 2009, and six years later, my father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And uh, he was given, uh, he had um, a Whipple surgery, successful chemotherapy. He was given 18 months to live, which is the standard diagnosis from point of diagnosis. Um, and uh, he basically died uh, just within his statistical uh, outcome, for, you know, prognosis. My mother, halfway through my father's pancreatic cancer, was diagnosed with a, a strange small cell endometrial cancer in 2016, and uh, which had metastasized everywhere. So she was stage four at diagnosis, and uh, she uh, wound up doing traditional uh, 
therapy, which was not um, not achieving results, and then wound up uh, doing various immunotherapy trials and died uh, more than three years later, which was far, far past her prognosis. So that is a uh, plug for immunotherapy. And, um, and I think it's important to take that extended family history so you can really see how much estrogen metabolism dysfunction uh, uh, the, both, the, both my mother's cancer and my father's cancer is strongly estrogen uh, estrogen driven. And, uh, and in my case, so because I'm high risk, I wound up having uh, hereditary genetic testing. My mother had no hereditary genes for her cancer, neither did my father. And then later I was run up as someone who was high risk for pancreatic cancer. And I have none of, none of the currently identified genes for, um, for hereditary cancer. There's actually new, there's new research coming out on, and as an aside, there's new research coming out um, on endometrial cancer at early stages, which is looking at over 200 genes um, to try and identify which of those may, may indicate higher risk. And some of the genes that ha are indicating higher risk of the endometrial cancers are estrogen metabolism genes, not modifiable ones though. So I, I know I'm running out of time. I just want to spend uh, a few minutes talking about uh, other case studies and how using genetic testing can allow a physician to treat women with more precision. So um, So here's an example of a 40-year-old woman. Uh, her mother died from breast cancer, and it's been my experience that it's only women who have breast cancer uh, history of some form in their family that know about the dangers of estrogen exposure. Um, very anxious about um, taking uh, either HRT or bioidentical hormones, but has severe perimenopausal symptoms and wants to, wants to find out if she can safely take them. If the uh, estrogen gene metabolism testing is conducted, this patient in particular only had one variation on CYP1B1, so she can safely be given uh, an intervention to help her, her perimenopausal and I assume menopausal symptoms. So she's falling on the very low risk. Here is an example of a 55-year-old woman who's been taking Prempro for five years. She comes in and um, is wondering about her own breast cancer risk. Turns out that this woman has variations on, on seven genes, putting her in a, um, a higher risk, many mutations or deletions, and prior estrogen use. Um, and so the recommendations are to stop stop the PremPro, add DIMPRO, the omegas are an antioxidant, talk about some lifestyle changes regarding uh, organic food or not living next to a highway, avoiding you know eating barbecue every day, um, be it as it may, based on the genetic uh, test results, and then monitor the doses until this woman is, is showing some form of improvement in her metabolite function through urine testing. Another example is a 35-year-old woman who wants to begin in vitro fertilization. This woman, this is where it gets very complicated because having a baby is involved. Um, this woman has mutations on seven, seven genes. And so one of the things that happens when you're doing IVF is people do breast cancer screening to see if you're clear. Um, and um, uh, this would allow physicians in that field to to determine how much uh, how much fertility treatments they actually want to prescribe. Perhaps they want to do one and see what happens. Um, the, uh, uh, but this woman is not a candidate for doing a dozen treatment. I actually know several women who have done literally a dozen a dozen rounds of IVF in their quest to have a baby. And so this person is certainly not a candidate for that. And even if she's going to have one treatment, she can be followed closely. 
or she can have that conversation about egg donors or adoption earlier. There's a, a new treatment, which is up also in my uh, website, where a cancer patient did not, the physicians chose not to give her fertility treatments to risk increasing her breast cancer or worsening her prognosis. And so they just went in and she was a young woman. They just went in directly without giving her, uh, without giving her the medications and were able to retrieve octites and mix them, grow them in the lab and um, after her treatment um, impregnate her safely. And I, I think I think that in the future this this will be the way this is this will be what happens, particularly with Brianna. So for that woman who she has, she hasn't actually had any prior estrogen use. She's she's still here. Um, and after she has IVF, should the physicians choose to proceed with that, she can become here where she can just be monitored more aggressively. And finally here, um, this is the last one I'm going to talk about, is a 60-year-old uh, woman with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. She has variations on five genes, which are is certainly no uh, no surprise for any estrogen receptor positive breast cancer patients. And so, in addition to continuing her aromatase inhibitor, she will add Jimpro omegas or the antioxidants. And uh, you know, with someone who's postmenopausal, uh, once the dosing requirements are are showing an indication of improvement, that metabolite testing can happen yearly. Um, is part of the annual checkup. Uh, oh, there is one more. And finally, a patient, a 35 year old with DCIS. Again, no surprise that she has variations on five genes. Um, She's, uh, it's been recommended that she take Avista. So she can take Avista. She may be put on tamoxifen as a precaution. She can improve her estrogen metabolism and be tackling both, both of those pathways that we looked at in the early, uh, early slides. So in conclusion, uh, I am advocating that we have uh, new protocols for um, standard care for all women but particularly for those women who are in those pools, patient pools of higher risk. Um, I encourage all of you to go to um, my website at uh, betterestrogen.com and look at some of the studies. There's actually a white paper in there that's maybe a few pages long, which is very, very succinctly reviews all of this information and provides a lot of references for those of you who like to read um, studies. But what I'm advocating is that the that the estrogen metabolism dysfunction on the extended family be added to um, be added to traditional intake for women, and that the estrogen metabolism genetic testing be extended to as many women as possible. This all allows physicians to determine specific individual risk for both the prescribing of estrogen-based medications and how aggressively someone has to be monitored. Um, I encourage you all again to to look at this work um, and uh, wish you a very happy and safe day. <laughs>